Hello, everyone. I'm Professor April Haynes, and I want to welcome you all to this presentation on the history of history at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, presented by Professor Emerita Colleen Dunlavey. I'm really looking forward to this talk personally, and I know you all are too. I want to briefly introduce Colleen and talk about how we'll run the conversation, and then we'll dive into the topic at hand. I want to especially thank members of the Board of Visitors who may be present right now and members of the History Club, as well as students and colleagues who are um, joining us today. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Professor Dunlevy, for sharing what you've learned about our department's history. It really means a lot to us. Colleen Dunlevy is, as I said, an emeritus um, professor of history and a cherished member of the University of Wisconsin-Madison history community. She earned her PhD at MIT after completing her master's and bachelor's degrees at UC Berkeley. She is a scholar of comparative capitalism and her book, Politics and Industrialization, Early Railroads in the United States and Prussia, was a co-winner of the Thomas Newcomen Award for Best Book in Business History. She has held several other prestigious fellowships from the Russell Sage Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and the Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History at Harvard. Professor Dunlavey will talk about the timeline of UW history that she has created. Please keep your camera off and your mic on mute to facilitate this process so that all can see and hear. We have a question. Please use the hand raising function in the center bottom of your screen. After I call your name, you'll have the floor. So please keep your questions brief so that everyone has a chance to speak and so that Professor Dunlavey can complete her thought. She may also decline to answer a question if she's getting there eventually in the talk. And with all of that said, I'll turn over the floor to Professor Dunlavey. Great, thank you. Uh, does that put me on the screen? I can't. Um, anyway, yes. I'm uh, <clears throat> uh, happy to be here. I'm not no longer in the classroom, so uh, a, a lot of you who are in the classroom these days, this format is becoming very familiar to you, I'm sure. Uh, it's less familiar to me, so um, for me it's a treat. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking with you uh, in this form today. Um, I want to talk about, I'm going to share my screen in a moment and, and actually walk you through a timeline that I've created of the history of the Department of History in a sort of broad sense uh, at, the U, at UW-Madison. Uh, before that, though, I want to say a few words about where this project came from. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it does not reflect uh, my becoming a historian of the UW. Uh, in fact, I think it's fair to say that the sum total of what I know about history at UW-Madison is in, in embodied in this timeline. You may have questions um, about uh, some aspects of the history of history at UW, and for most of them, I can probably give you advice about where you might find the answer, but I probably won't be able to tell you the answer myself. Uh, instead, this project came from two other sources, really. One is that uh, in addition to uh, teaching business history and history of technology and history of capitalism and so on, towards the end of my teaching career, I also taught courses on digital history. Um, part of an, uh, an what I thought was uh, what I thought of as an effort to kind of help some of our grad students uh, develop their digital skills. Um, this goes back I don't know what five, six, seven years ago. <clears throat> and one of the technologies I used was something called Timeline JS, which you'll see in a minute. Um, and it's a, a software platform that um, is put out by Northwestern University's Night Lab. I'll say a little bit more about it at the end. In fact, I'm going to make a pitch for those of you who are teaching that you think about using this uh, in your courses, having students create timelines, because it's so easy to use. Uh, it really allows you to focus on the history and not the technology of making such a timeline. Uh, so I had uh, introduced my students to this in my digital history classes, and I had not really used it for a full-blown project. I thought, well, I'll do a timeline. 
that's one impetus. The other is that I have long uh, believed that um, historians don't know enough about their own history. Uh, and so I have in the past taught, taught courses about the history of the discipline of history, um, not specifically at Wisconsin, but this represents kind of a, a, an outgrowth of that longstanding conviction that historians need to know more about the history of their own discipline. <clears throat> So, uh, so I made it is uh, I'm showing it to you today. It will, in due course, before too long, uh, be launched on the department's website. And this session about it today is being recorded uh, to provide um, an accessible, uh, an alternative for uh, uh, an alternative accessible form uh, of presentation, if you will. Um, so you can, in, in hopefully not too long, you'll be able to, we'll publicize it, of course, uh, you'll be able to find it on the department website and you can page through it uh, just the way that I'm going to do it uh, now. So uh, now I need to share my screen, share an application, share that there. Okay. Um, so you're seeing here the opening slide of this. It's an interactive thing. Um, I have enlarged it to make it uh, more legible from your perspective. It actually extends down below. There's a little bit of a timeline function here. Whoops, I can't screen. <laughs> Clicking on the wrong screen. Uh, founding of the UW, first historian, et cetera, et cetera. You can move through the timeline that way. Uh, I'm not going to do that um, today. I'm going to go back to the beginning, and I'll just go through the slides themselves. As I said, blown up a bit so you can see them. So this is the introductory slide. Um, <clears throat> throughout the, um, the timeline, there are links. So for example, here is a hyperlink. If you click this link, hold on a second, I have to get out of full screen mode here. If you click this link, then in a new tab, you'll see where I got that image. And one of the great things about working with this uh, software is it's easy. All you do is uh, put a link to this uh, image in a spreadsheet and whoop, it pops right into your timeline. Um, so you can do that throughout. I also use hyperlinks. Um, <clears throat> I use hyperlinks. Uh, for most of the images, uh, as you'll see, uh, um, I, I have hyperlinks for background on people and background on publications and so on and so forth. Okay, so the timeline starts uh, with the founding of the university, and the first couple of slides are <clears throat> about that context. Um, the UW, as some of you probably know, was established in the state constitution of 1848. Its origins actually go back a bit further to the uh, to 1836, 1838, uh, when the territory of Wisconsin received a federal land grant. Um, <clears throat> I hope this is coming through okay. I just got a message saying my bandwidth is poor. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so the UW was founded uh, in uh, 1848 formally in the state constitution. Uh, held its first classes in 1849. It was small, as you can imagine. Uh, two faculty members by 1850, uh, a total of um, uh, 17 students uh, in the first class, all male students. Um, the initial curriculum uh, was a so-called classical uh, curriculum featuring courses on mathematics, uh, ancient history, um, <clears throat> literature and so on, but uh, I'll just move to the next slide here. Uh, the founding concepts that <clears throat> um, underlay the, the university as an institution included the idea that it should uh, be open not just to elites, but to all Wisconsinites uh, who were capable of benefiting from such training. And so it had a certain practical element of its curriculum from the very beginning. In the quotation on the left here, 
this is taken from the preface to the first volume of a four volume history of the University of Wisconsin. Uh, the first two volumes uh, um, uh, authored by uh, historians Merle Curdy. There's a link here that will take you to a photograph of them, Professors Karstensen and Curdy uh, cutting a ceremonial steak, uh, sorry, <laughs> a ceremonial cake at a testimonial luncheon in honor of. Uh, in their honor as authors of this volume that I'm talking about here. Um, that's an example of the kind of uh, thing that I, it sort of provides a little uh, additional context beyond what's in the slides themselves. So this four volume history is available uh, <clears throat> for public use on the UW Library's digital collections. There's another digital, there's another uh, hyperlink here. I'm not going to click that, but it will take you to the page that has a link for each volume. You can then uh, drill down into those and see um, what's in each volume and read the whole thing from beginning to end if you want. Uh, the, the second half, volumes three and four, were published in the 1990s uh, by uh, E. David John, uh, Cronin and John Jenkins. All right, so that's the sort of initial context in which the history department eventually was situated. Um, the, the study of U.S. history and general history were added uh, in the um, catalog. This is a, uh, shows you an image from the catalog of 1858 when those courses were added. Uh, now, at this time, the UW had about eight or maybe ten eight faculty members, none of whom was a historian as such, because um, there was uh, the, the discipline of history didn't really exist as such, uh, and there were no historians as such on the um, on the staff of the university. So not clear who taught these courses. Some of you may know uh, if you've looked into the early history of the university, but it's not information that I've found. Uh, also on this slide, you'll see there are links to uh, UW course catalogs. Um, there are two collections, sort of overlapping collections. The UW Library's di digital uh, collections has catalogs in the 19th century, 1853 to 1899. And then the history department in its course catalog archive has uh, the history section of catalogs from 1852 to 1996. And th they were a very important resource for me as I was trying to figure out the kind of uh, turning points and bench point benchmarks in the history of the Department of History. Uh, so that's 1858. Uh, and, and as that um, uh, extract indicates, this is a course being offered and being taught already in 1858, History of the United States, and then General History, which uh, I have to assume was uh, meant essentially European history. Okay. <clears throat> Um, also dating back to that same era of the 1850s, 1840s and 1850s is the Wisconsin Historical Society located across uh, adjacent to the Humanities Building on Library Mall. This was established in 1846 and uh, is the oldest historical society in the U.S. to have received continuous state funding. That's an incredibly important resource. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, for historians uh, of the United States, of course, but also uh, historians of many other countries. It has really fabulous collections. Um, and, and this is another instance I'll show you here, a uh, point out here in which I use hyperlinks to point you to literature. So if you want to, in this case, to read about the history of historical societies in the United States, you can follow this link and follow up uh, on that book or um, it doesn't give you a link that lets you read the book, uh, but at least it'll tell you what to read if you want to read more about it. The sources for each of the individual slides then are indicated down at the bottom, as you can see here, uh, an online source from the Wisconsin Legislative Reference Bureau and another online um, <clears throat> source in UW Digital Collections, uh, a book on the buildings of the UW uh, campus. All right, moving on. 
Uh, timeline, as you can imagine, is organized chronologically. Sometimes I skip around a little bit in chronology, and this is an instance of that. Uh, in the 1860s, uh, the UW allowed women to enroll in its so-called normal department. Of uh, and in the fall of 1863, this is information um, drawn from the history of the UW that uh, I was talking about earlier. Uh, in uh, the fall of 1863, uh, more than half of UW students were women, actually. And then in 1866, the Wisconsin legislature passed a measure specifically providing that the university was to be open to women in all its departments, not just in the teaching college. Uh, this was controversial at the time, and you can read about that in the history uh, of the UW. I've included this image, which is not from the 1860s, but from the 1890s. Uh, because on the one hand, it uh, shows a seminar setting, uh, as you can, um, can see here readily. And uh, secondly, it shows the members of the seminar, two of the uh, women standing, the two standing women here are staff members. The rest of the students, uh, the people are students. This is Professor Frederick Jackson Turner uh, here, uh, second from the right. And if you do the math, you just count up the numbers, you'll see that here too, the majority of uh, students were women, which is I think interesting and probably underappreciated uh, um, aspect of the history uh, of women at the UW. Um, <clears throat> the first historian to actually come on staff came in 1867. This is William Francis Allen. You may have, if you've been in the <clears throat> Sorry, my allergies are bothering me today. If you've been in the um, conference room at, in the history department, you've seen his uh, a painting of him, I believe. He joined in 1867. He was a specialist in ancient and medieval history, but also uh, knew something about um, American history as well, uh, and in particular about slave songs. He published a very important, what mu musicologists regard as a very important book, I'm going to click this link uh, uh, and show you um, another kind of source that you can get to by reading my timeline and clicking the links when it comes. This is that book, 1867. It's on the Internet Archive. You can see that up here on the left. And you can just sit here. Whoops, I have to do it on my real screen. Uh, you can sit here and simply page through. Uh, and read this book. You can also download it if you want to. Um, but it's really, uh, I, I love things like this. I love this kind of sources. And so one of the things I like about the timeline, uh, the technology of the timeline is being able to, um, being able to, to uh, whoops, being able to incorporate it right into, um, make it easy for the reader to access uh, materials like this that are available online. All right, so William Francis Allen is the first historian as such. He was hired as a professor of ancient languages and history, uh, reflecting the fact that history was not really a separate discipline yet by this time. Uh, it would become so in the 1880s, or take on some of the institutional characteristics of a, a separate discipline in the 1880s. All right, forging ahead a little bit, we see that um, in about 1889, 1890, then the uh, the university began to um, strengthen its graduate offerings. This, uh, the university, like most American colleges, started, started out with undergraduate training, but then began to add advanced studies or graduate studies. UW did that beginning in the late 60s. And then in uh, between 1889 and 1891, it brought two historians on board. One is C.H. Uh, Haskins, who was a um, European medieval historian, and the other was arguably the most famous American historian ever, uh, Frederick Jackson Turner. Um, both, of those, both of them had studied at Hopkins, received their PhDs at Hopkins. Um, and then in 1892, the political economist Richard T. Ely then also came to the UW uh, as head of a new school of economics, political science, and history. Now, this uh, school of, uh, of the three of those things, the three of those topics, what we today think of as separate disciplines were at that time just becoming separate disciplines. 
And I will here mention also one of the fun things about putting together uh, a timeline like this is finding images uh, that are appropriate to the slides. Almost all, not all, but almost all of my slides have some kind of an image associated with them. And uh, <clears throat> I, I really uh, um, have a lot of fun trying to find an image that I feel like encapsulates what I'm trying to express. This happens to be a social network analysis visualization. And the slide is about the emergence of these separate disciplines really out of a single well, if you will. Uh, so the American Historical Association uh, formed initially under the auspices of the American Social Science Association. That was in 1884. It convened for the first time uh, with the American Social Science uh, Association. Then in 1885, a year later, uh, there were discussions at the AHA's annual meeting that gave rise of, uh, in short order to the American Economic Association. Uh, and then about a, a, a decade later, um, the American Political Science Association uh, grew out of discussions at a joint annual meeting of the American Historical Association and the American Economics Association. It's a really interesting, I think, history of this sort of emerging out of a common uh, uh, interest in the social sciences, the emergence and formalization of these separate disciplines. That's happening in the 1880s, in, in, the, in the late 19th century. Um, Fre so Frederick Jackson Turner came to the UW in 1889 from Johns Hopkins, as I mentioned, um, <clears throat> where he had done his PhD. He was actually in a native of Portage, Wisconsin, and uh, our own uh, Bill Cronin is uh, writing a history uh, that centers on Portage, Wisconsin. Um, he had studied as an undergraduate here, William Francis Allen, gone off to Hopkins for graduate studies and then came back to the UW uh, in 1889. Uh, he proceeded to introduce two new courses that were, uh, according to Curdy and Karstensen, uh, un unprecedented at the time. Um, one was a history of society that moved from quote unquote primitive society up to modern civilization. And the other was a course on economic and social history of the United States. This was at a time when the mainstream history was primarily uh, political history, diplomatic history and the like. Economic and social history were Oh, what is it? Oh, I should have looked this up. There's a wonderful quotation of somebody referring to economic history in the 1890s as I don't know what something like uh, something like dirty laundry or some some equivalent expression. It wasn't was not so uh, <clears throat> well respected, let's say, uh, as political and and diplomatic history. All right. So then the fall in 1893 uh, is when Turner gave his. A uh, famous talk at the World's Columbian Exposition to the AHA's annual meeting. There's a link here uh, to that, um, uh, uh, to, to a version of that on the AHA's website, a link to a page about the World's Columbian Exhibition, and also a bibliographic reference if you're interested uh, in following up on Turner himself, on his writings. Okay. Um, one of the most important firsts, of course, in the history of a, 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 of a, a department is uh, a graduate department is when it offered its first PhD, the history department, uh, did so in 1893 uh, to a woman named Kate Everest, uh, later Kate Everest Levy, it was her married name. She was, uh, I, call, I say triple first here because she was uh, the first PhD uh, awarded by our department it was the first PhD that the UW awarded to a woman, and she's considered to be the first woman to receive the history PhD from an organized graduate school uh, in the United States. She went on uh, to publish on German immigration uh, in the US. If you click this link um, up here to, uh, on her name, that takes you, I'm not seeing it at the moment, but I'm pretty sure that takes you to a Wikipedia page about her, which uh, it has um, considerable detail. There's not much known about her, really. Uh, she later went into administrative work, served as the Dean of Women at Lawrence College in Appleton, 
uh, worked at a couple of uh, um, settlement houses, Chicago's Hull House and a, a similar institution in Pittsburgh, and then ended up supervising the archives at the Historical Society here in Madison from 1918 to 1926. Um, you can look at the full list of our PhDs uh, awarded by clicking on this link. And if you go all the way back to the beginning, you'll find her there in 1893. <clears throat> uh, another uh, big event of the 1890s was, um, I'm sure many of, maybe all of you know about this, uh, Richard T. Ely's teaching at the university and charges uh, by a member of the UW Board of Regents um, that uh, who who, uh, who made a charge investigated by the Board of Regents, uh, a charge, in other words, by one of its members, um, that Ely was uh, uh, preaching sedition, impractical, pernicious doctrines. Uh, as a result of that information, uh, that investigation, the Regents exonerated him and did so in a ringing endorsement of academic freedom. This is where the lines, the second sentence in this quotation here, uh, come from that are on a plaque on Bascom Hall. I'm sure you've seen it. If you click this link here, um, commemorative plaque link, uh, you'll see it there as well, and you'll be taken to an LNS uh, web page about the, the plaque. Um, there is a study of uh, there's a couple of links here. Um, you can click on the Wisconsin idea and go to uh, that publication by a man named Charles McCarthy in 1912, or you can click on uh, the link in this box, which will take you to uh, a study published in 1949 about the sifting and winnowing controversy published by Theodore Herforth, name familiar to many of us at the UW. Okay, <clears throat> whoops, wrong. Uh, there we go. All right. Uh, so the next event uh, came in uh, 1900 when the UW established a separate school of history. This came uh, in response to an offer that uh, Frederick Jackson Turner had from the University of Chicago. He turned it down and uh, part of the recruitment package was the creation of this school of history. Um, you can see here the, um, the description of it in the catalog, a UW catalog from 1900-1901 uh, that also shows you the faculty members at the time. These, uh, I don't know if my arrow is showing up on your screen here, my cursor, but these appear to be fellows. Uh, these are fellows. I take that to mean students. And so the regular faculty is the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven individuals uh, named up here, including one who's president of university. Director of the new school was uh, Frederick Jackson Turner. Um, and uh, there were also by that time, uh, at that time, historians in the new school of commerce or business school. Um, the director of that was a professor of economic history and several uh, of these history faculty were also listed in its instructional staff. Uh, school of history didn't last very long. It was integrated a few years later into the College of Letters and Science. Turner himself moved to Harvard in 1910 because he was under pressure from the regents to teach more and didn't want to. And uh, so he moved to Harvard and then uh, won a Pulitzer Prize in 1932 for his book on the significant significance of sections in American history, which far fewer people have read than his uh, essay on the significance of the frontier. But I certainly would recommend it. I, I think it's one of his best pieces. Um, okay, so uh, other uh, benchmarks in the early 20th century history of the UW generally uh, include the, the Wisconsin idea. Um, and this uh, is a, a, a summary of the Wisconsin idea from a, an article that Frederick Jackson Turner published on the extension work of the University of Wisconsin. Um, and as you can see, the last part of it says the policy of the university is, is extends through the extension movement to the whole of the state of Wisconsin. There are links on this slide if you want to um, <clears throat> look, uh, go to a 1912 book that's available online. Uh, and I've also provided 
uh, a bibliographic citation to a work on the history of historians and their publics um, that will provide additional context. Um, I'm going to speed up here a little bit because uh, I do want to get through the whole thing and not keep you too long into the evening. Okay, as many of you know, the History of Science Department, you may know two things. First of all, the History of Science Department is uh, was one of the oldest, was, let me take that back, it was the oldest History of Science Department in the country, and it also merged with the History Department in 2017. So I've included the History of Science in this timeline along the way, as you'll see. Uh, the very first courses in the uh, history of science were taught um, not in the history department. Uh, they were never in the history department before the merger in 2017. Uh, instead, they were taught uh, in the School of Pharmacy. A course was taught on the history of chemistry um, and <clears throat> that, um, and a general course added in 1921 on science more broadly. Uh, again, citations where that information comes from, and then also if you want to read more about the early history. This, this illustration, as you can see, comes from the Library Club of Philadelphia. It's taken from an early 1850 encyclopedia uh, of chemistry. As I said before, finding the illustrations is one of the most enjoyable aspects. Uh, this slide just presents an as, uh, a snapshot of the department in 1915. Uh, Twelve faculty members named here, additional a couple of fellows and a so-called scholar. As you can see, uh, the faculty were at this point, so far as we know, all white male and quite likely Protestant. Uh, historians of other persuasions were not really uh, hired by the top tier of universities until after World War II, and that was true of the UW as well. Uh, at this time, the UW uh, offered uh, undergraduate and graduate degrees in history with specializations either in American history or in uh, European history. But if you go and look at the 1905-1906 um, course catalog, which you can do by clicking the link down here in the footnote, uh, you'll see in there some uh, courses that touch on the history of East Asia, South Asia, the Ottoman Empire, and Africa, uh, always within the framework of European, mainly British, industrial history. Um, there have, over the course of the 20th century, two so-called Wisconsin schools come, come out of the University of Wisconsin. Uh, the first of those is not directly out of the history department, but it is if you think of history as part of this broader web of disciplines in the early 20th century. That first Wisconsin school is the Wisconsin School of Labor History or uh, of Industrial Relations more generally. It's centered around a man named John R. Commons, and you can uh, find out more information about him by clicking the link here. Um, <clears throat> he was a uh, he and his colleagues, he was an institutional economist, very active in drafting legislation here in Wisconsin and also New Deal legislation. But he and his colleagues also published some foundational works in economic history, labor history, social history in the broad sense that it was used in the early 20th century. Um, and I've included links if you want to look at the first volume of, of, uh, and a, of a 10 volume set called the Documentary History of American Industrial Society. You can click the link here. This is a, a portion of the uh, title page of that. Volume one was on Plantation and Frontier. Uh, and then that was followed by a four volume history of labor in the United States. Uh, and you can click the link here to look at volume one. These two are available on the web through the Internet Archive and, and similar sorts of um, uh, depository. Uh, repositories of documents. Okay, uh, Pulitzer Prizes, another thing I track in the uh, timeline. We've had several over the uh, department's history. The first of those went to uh, an American historian of the West, uh, Frederick Jackson Turner's successor, Frederick L. Paxton. He won the P Pulitzer Prize in 1925. The Pulitzer Prize in history was established in 1917, so uh, it was a relatively new prize at that time. Uh, he took Turner's place here and wrote really a, a 
kind of synthetic history of the frontier that Turner himself uh, never uh, did manage to produce. Um, our PhDs have also won Pulitzer Prizes, and initially I had one slide for each of these and decided that was too much information, and so I put them all in one slide. This is a list of the uh, grad students of ours who've gone on to win the Pulitzer Prize in History uh, between uh, 1931 and last year, 2019. And you have clinks, uh, clinks. You, have, you can click the links here uh, to give you more information about the person uh, and also uh, about the books, at least a link to a description of the books that won the prize. And there is a link then to the full list of Pulitzer, Pulitzer Prize winners uh, as well. Uh, in the 1930s is when we begin to see in the course catalogs uh, an expansion of the teaching of history beyond US and European history. Uh, as I mentioned before, a couple of slides ago, there are hints in the treatment of the British imperial history, but it's really only in the late 1930s that, uh, that marks a departure. Um, even though Turner himself had been teaching, uh, had been emphasizing economic and social factors in American history since he came to the UW, the curriculum itself, at least as it's manifested in these course catalogs and organized in the course catalogs, was still framed in geographic terms around the US and Europe. Uh, and so in the 1938-39 catalog, what you see is two things. First of all, a new category of courses, economic and social history. So now it was uh, um, US history, modern history, um, Latin, uh, sorry, US history, modern history, uh, economic and social history. And that category pulled together US and European courses. The other departure is the first move out in formal terms outside uh, of the US European framework. And that edition of History 119, I think the number is still uh, active. Um, Latin American history, a survey uh, of pre Columbian colonial and Republican periods. This was taught by an instructor um, at this point, uh, uh, an instructor by the name of Fred Harvey Harrington, who has uh, an illustrious history of his own with the UW, uh, later served as president of the uh, UW. I think that was at the time equivalent of chancellor. So that's the first sort of move towards a more um, expansive history. Uh, in the 1940s, a few years later, then uh, a UW curriculum committee um, decided, of course, in 1940 is the, the war in Europe is already going on. It's a year before the US uh, enters World War II. Uh, and this curriculum committee was, was um, proposed, what it did is propose three new interdisciplinary courses aiming to sort of bring students up to speed on aspects of the modern world. And one of those courses for sophomores was called the History and Significance of Science. This poster, this is a WPA a uh, poster from the Library of Congress comes exactly out of that period. It's called Keeping Up with Science, and it's uh, dated to the period 1936 to 1939. The UW did hire a young historian of Harvard from uh, historian of science from Harvard uh, to launch the new department, but we then entered the war. Uh, the historian left in 1943 to take a position as uh, in the federal government essentially during the war as a historian. And so that was uh, marked the first very for first formal steps, but very tiny steps at that point. Um, also in during World War II, uh, the UW experienced sharp cuts in legislative funding and that prompted a self-study that gave rise to the present day interdisciplinary divisions of, of the university, which are certainly familiar to faculty if not to students biological sciences, humanities, et cetera. Um, history at that time was uh, beginning increasingly to incorporate social science theory and methods. And so historians were initially members of both social studies and humanities. That is to say, an individual faculty member was a member of both divisions. Later on, in the midst of there's some controversy about this apparently, 
uh, opposition resistance from the history department, but later on, faculty members then had to choose which division they wanted to be in, um, humanities and social science. And now when I end, I was in social sciences, a number or social studies, a number of my colleagues were. Now I venture to say that almost everybody on the history faculty are in the humanities division, which reflects changes uh, in the discipline of history over the last 30 years since I started. Okay, um, another Pulitzer Prize, this one meant, went to Merle Curdy, uh, who joined the UW faculty in 1944 and then won a Pulitzer Prize two years later for his book published in 1943, The Growth of American Thought. He was a pioneer uh, in social and intellectual history, um, served as president of the AHA, taught in our department until 1968, but remained uh, very actively engaged with the department and the profession until his death in 1996. Uh, in fact, he established the, er, the Merle Curdy Lecture Series, and I believe some of my but I believe he attended those lectures uh, right up until um, near the end of his life. Uh, we also have, uh, thanks to his beneficence, the Merle Curdy Teaching Fellowship that we're able uh, to offer our advanced graduate students. Um, <clears throat> in the era, of course, uh, World War II, uh, the UW saw a tremendous, as did the academy across the country, uh, saw so tremendous fluctuations in enrollments. Um, and this graph, I think, sort of conveys that, especially if you sort of take a moment to ponder the numbers. You see that enrollments at when the war began, when American participation in the war began, plunged from about 12,000 to about 6,000. So plunged by 50%. And then uh, in the space of just a few years, uh, d tripled, I think it is, from about 6,000 to about 18,000, if you can imagine that. Just contemplate that for a few moments. Uh, one of the examples that Curdy and Karstensen give in their history of the university is enrollments in History 3A, as, as it was called at the time, European Civilization from 800 to 1660. Uh, that um, enrollment doubled um, from the pre-war levels by the of 1945 and then went even higher uh, in the spring of 1946. At that point, they cap capped enrollment in the course, uh, split it into three courses, had only one professor available to teach a course, but enlisted two graduate students to teach the other two versions of it. Uh, in the meantime, over that decade from the mid 40s to the mid 50s, the size of the history faculty uh, nearly doubled, reaching 20 by 1956-58. Uh, this is the information I get from the um, course catalog simply by counting up the number of uh, the number of uh, uh, faculty member listed in the catalog. Okay. Um, history of science then uh, in the aftermath of the World War is firmly established. This illust the illustration here is the cover of a very famous report, uh, to famous to historians of science, certainly, report to the President of the United States called Science, the Endless Frontier. Um, faculty members were brought on board in 1947. Undergraduate major in the history of science was approved in 1947-48. Uh, introductory courses uh, drew hundreds of students uh, annually from 1948 through 1965 and beyond. Uh, and from 1948, the department also uh, enrolled students in uh, doctoral programs. Initially, it could do so only jointly with the chemistry or history departments, but from 1958, it was permitted to grant its own PhDs in history of science. Um, we now have, of course, we still have joint degrees as an option. So that really marks the, the firm establishment of this department uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the first of its kind uh, in the United States. Uh, looking at history a little more broadly at the UW, of course, we can't overlook uh, what was going on next door uh, at the law school just up uh, Bascom Hill from the, from the humanities building. There, the pivotal figure was the legal historian J. Willard Hurst, who pioneered 
what became known as modern, modern legal history, um, which he saw as a product of uh, social, economic, and political forces rather than some self uh sort of body of uh, self-standing judicial doctrine. Uh, he taught at the uh, in the law school for several decades. His best known work is this massive uh, history of uh, like eight or eight hundred pages or something history of Wisconsin's uh, lumber industry from focusing on law, as the title indicates, focusing on the legal and economic aspects of that. Uh, and legal historians in the UW Law School are. Uh, generally hold joint appointments in the history department as well, so that uh, relationship uh, continues. In fact, is arguably stronger now than it was uh, when Willard Hurst was um, the, the dean of legal history. Um, <clears throat> another uh, Wisconsin school uh, arose in the 1950s. This is the Wisconsin School of Diplomatic History, centered around diplomatic historian William Appleman Williams. The little illustration here is of a note that he appended um, to, I think it was his annual like merit review report, uh, notifying his department chair that he's um, publishing a new book called The Tragedy of American Dis Diplomacy. This was appeared in 1959 and uh, is basically reoriented or certainly challenged the existing historiography on American diplomatic history by recasting the US itself as an imperial uh, power. If you click the link here on the, uh, underneath the illustration or the link in the sources here, you'll be taken to an LNS uh, story about it from which I got this illustration. Um, so uh, approaching a little closer to our own time, this is a graph based on history department data of enrollment in our graduate program. And again, take a moment to pause and look at the numbers here. The red line shows the PhDs granted, and the blue line shows the size of incoming classes. As you can see from 1950 through the 1950s, uh, the size of incoming classes is about 20. The number of PhDs granted is uh, less than 10, although trending upward towards the end of that period. Then comes just a tremendous explosion that brings uh, at its peak incoming class size of 90 in 1965-66, according to our data. And the number of PhDs awarded uh, peaked in 1970-71 at 70, 70 PhDs per year. Um, history of science went through on a smaller scale, a very similar surge in graduate enrollments and in the production of PhDs. Um, produced as many PhDs in the five-year period between 1960 and 19, or 1966 and 1970 as it did in the previous uh, two decades. Um, so just a tremendous e e explosion. Uh, if there's any uh, listeners in the audience who remember our graduate advisor, Judith Cochran, I've included here a link to uh, her obituary in the Madison newspapers. Um, she, it's amazing that she practically single-handedly advised uh, all of these graduate students beginning uh, in 1969. But well, I won't get into department lore, but it puts in perspective some of the regulations we've had in the past. Okay, so another uh, uh, and and real surge in the the uh, global scope of. Uh, the history department's coverage came in the post-war era. And this slide simply recounts uh, briefly the arrival of uh, influential individuals, major figures, and uh, topics, geographic areas uh, becoming part of the history curriculum. So from East Asian history through African history, South Asian history, Southeast Asian history, uh, Ottoman and Turkish history, African American history, uh, and uh, uh, which was granted uh, and has been sustained really through the Department of Afro-American Studies and our relationship with that uh, department. The second aspect of going global in this period was uh, visible <clears throat> in the mid-1960s, and that's when a new structure appeared in the course catalog. 
all of a sudden this thing uh, called comparative tropical history illustrated here in uh, a pamphlet that is in the UW archives. Uh, so the, the longstanding structure was US history and European history. Um, over time, American history had expanded to include Canada, Mexi Canada, Mexico, and Latin America. And modern history was mainly Europe, but also included Africa, East Asia, and South Asia. So in the mid 60s, that structure was re reformed. <coughs> And out of that comes U.S. history, uh, European history, now a new category of comparative tropical history, and East Asian history as a fourth category. By that time, they, the, uh, by 1970, the history department had 63 faculty members, which is, I think, near a peak for it. Okay. Um, also, in the post-war era, uh, the Department, the university's offerings in the history of science were fleshed out in multiple directions. One was by formalizing uh, medical history in the Department of the History of Medicine in 1950. Uh, in the 1960s, the College of Engineering appointed a couple of historians of technology who also held joint appointments in the History of Science Department. And uh, about 12, 13, 14 years ago, then the degree programs were renamed History of Science, Medicine, and Technology rather than simply History of Science. This is a particular, <laughs> for the present circumstances, I think a very nice uh, illustration uh, to, to dem demonstrate the wedding of science, medicine, and technology. It's an illustration called Vaccinating the Poor from 1873 that's in the collections of the U.S. National Library of Medicine. Um, the next slide is about something that most people probably don't know about the history of the university, and that is that it was once uh, one of the premier institutions for the study of economic history. Uh, this was in the 1950s and 1960s. It was uh, a, a kind of joint uh, endeavor of the history and economics departments. There were faculty in both departments that cooperated in this program. A graduate program was launched, had been established at least by 1964. I don't know when it was actually inaugurated. Uh, and by the mid 1960s, the history department's course listings included economic history as a new category in which 18 courses uh, were listed. That eventually, sort of for a variety of reasons, faded away as economic history. Uh, took a methodological turn that, um, that didn't appeal to historians and also uh, as it tended to get cut in economics departments in times of austerity. But for a moment there in the 50s and 60s, this was uh, building on that earlier history of John, John R. Commons and Richard Ely and so on. This was really a, a, one of the main, internationally, one of the main centers for the study of economic history. Uh, in the 1960s, uh, the Historical Society developed one of the largest collections of documents re relating to the civil rights movement. And uh, some of you may have may know the story of this, but was largely the work of a handful of history graduate students. Um, there is an article I would recommend to you about this by Michael Edmonds, who's uh, now um, retired from the Historical Society. Uh, about the, the initiative of these new students. They came in as first year students, I think, um, with prior political experience in the civil rights movement and set about uh, organizing this network with financial support from historical society to collect thousands of pages of documents uh, from various organizations active in the civil rights movement and also by going around in the South collecting locally. And this is an illustration of that. Um, you can, there are links to the um, history, to the historical society's pages relating to that. Uh, <clears throat> also a feature of the 1960s, enrollments increased dramatically across the UW. If you look at this um, uh, graph again, here's the portion I showed you earlier of the wartime uh, crash, whoops, crash, and then surge in enrollments, and then comes 
in the 1950s and 60s, just a tremendous expansion of the academy across the US. Uh, part of this is the GI Bill. Uh, it's it's uh, just a, a brings a revolution really in the university um, teaching and university education. Features of the, of the department's history in that period include very popular lecturers who have left legacies in the George L. Mossy program uh, and in the Harvey Goldberg Center. Um, they were both very popular lecturers. Uh, you can read more about them um, in the sources I've cited here, which are um, uh, short capsule uh, summaries on the web and um, um, yeah, it's interesting that there doesn't seem to be as written about Harvey Goldberg as about George Mossy. Uh, and also George Mossy wrote, uh, published a memoir of his own. And so there's, uh, I would definitely recommend that to you if you're interested in the background of these two very powerful and popular lecturers in the history department. Um, History department in the organizational fervor, if you will, of the 1960s history department graduate students also organized. This page uh, shows the cover of a, um, a booklet that is in the UW archives that was put out by the UW History Graduate Association, a brochure in 1968. This is the History, <laughs> history Students Association looking under Cleo's skirts, as you can um, I recommend that you uh, read it. It's, it makes for interesting reading. There's a link here on the slide itself uh, to the pamphlet. There's a second organization. I don't know what happened to this. If anybody does know, I'd be happy to um, hear more about that. But the, the, um, the second organization formed in the late 1970s, and I quote our uh, colleague Stanley Payne uh, about the context of the times, which will sound somewhat familiar to uh, our own graduate students today. Um, there's a slide just uh, noting the move of the history department from Bascom Hall uh, to the humanities building. Uh, a couple of slides on faculty diversity. The first slide, faculty diversity one, uh, uh, describes the arrival of uh, women faculty members to the Department of History. The first was Diane Lindstrom hired as an assistant professor in American economic history in 1971. And then a couple years later, European economic historian Maureen Mazowie joined the department. Uh, <clears throat> by 1999, out of 59 faculty members were uh, women and uh, next door, so to speak, uh, in the history of science department, Judy Levitt had joined in 1975, making her the first woman with an appointment in history of science and in the history of medicine department. Today's, uh, this link will take you to our faculty uh, page on the department website. And uh, by my count, uh, the majority of our faculty members uh, now, 55 in total, are women. The majority of that 55 are women. The second uh, diver diversity slide looks at uh, ethnicity and race. Um, mentions George Mossy as far as I can tell, the first Jewish member of the faculty. Uh, several Asian members of the faculty who arrived around 1970 or so. Um, and the first African-American faculty member was William A. Brown or Bill Brown, as he was better known, who had done his PhD in our department uh, and then joined uh, after teaching elsewhere at Brown, Harvard, uh, Brown, sorry, Brown and Harvard. Uh, and in Nigeria, then joined our department in 1974 and taught here for several decades. Uh, there's lots of information about our, our faculty uh, in the UW archives and UW digital collections, but it's hard to uh, ferret out. So uh, I, I encourage you to do that if you're interested, uh, but it takes a lot of work. Um, next benchmark that I highlight in the timeline is the founding of women's history. The first course appeared in the 1976-78 uh, catalog taught by that first woman historian uh, in the department, Amer uh, Diane Lindstrom. A formal program was launched in 1981-82. This brochure announces that. You can see here introducing a graduate program. 
initially in American women's history. Uh, since then, it has exp expanded its uh, scope uh, globally and also its thematic breadth to encompass women's history, gender history, history of sexu sexuality. Um, this is history that I have, was able to follow in a collection of history newsletters that the department has on its website. Um, <clears throat> undergraduate, I have towards the end of the timeline here just a couple of summary slides showing changes in undergraduate enrollments. This is a, a, a slide of undergraduate degrees converged, uh, conferred, sorry, um, which shows a couple of peaks. The first peak uh, comes, came in 1992 when more than 400 uh, degrees were offered. Then there's a series of uh, downs uh, and ups. Uh, the last peak um, came in about 2008, 2007 maybe, and the trend since then has been a pretty uh, sharp downward trend. And that's a nationwide trend. I have a, a link here that you'll see to an article on uh, a, a Academy newsletter uh, about um, history, trend, history majors. Uh, and also a link to a page on the History Department's own website about what we're doing to kind of try and counteract this trend. It's needless to say, not a good development uh, in the sense that um, uh, the, we, when I say we here, it's certainly my uh, strong belief that uh, good citizens need strong historical knowledge and that the skills that historians learn are going to be the skills in highest demand in coming years as robotics and artificial intelligence sort of re, re, reformulate our world. Graduate challenges, uh, one central peak here, this is not the peak I showed you earlier, which was the all-time peak back in uh, the late 1960s. This is a peak again around 1990. Um, the size of entering classes got, as you can see here, way out of whack. Uh, and I explain on this side, so, uh, slide that we accepted a lot of students funding in those days, and this is one of the consequences of that, that the number of students we took in uh, got way out of whack, uh, way out of alignment with the number of PhDs that we granted. And so in recent years, they're very definitely uh, in much closer alignment since we've become what's called a fully funded graduate program. So that's good. That's good news. Um, in the meantime, we're trying to encourage our students to broaden themselves both in terms of their uh, areas of expertise in history and also in the skills that they bring to use uh, in, in the classroom that might uh, find use outside the classroom as well. Um, <clears throat> now we're coming to very recent history. This is a history that uh, part of my personal history in the department, a restructuring of the department. This is another one of my favorite images, as you can see here. It's called Congressional Pugilists. And that uh, um, uh, I, I chose it to reflect the sort of atmosphere in which this restructuring of the department was carried on in the early um, early 90s. Um, the old structure had gendered had engendered pitched battles uh, over faculty appointment, and also contributed to that misalignment of the um, graduate enrollments that you saw there, because the different caucuses, as they were called operated relatively autonomously. And so part of bringing those graduate enrollments and graduate degrees into closer alignment was this restructuring that happened back in the early 1990s. Uh, first women department chairs, the first department history department chair was Florencia Mallon, a professor emerita, uh, professor of uh, modern uh, Latin American history in the uh, History of Science Department. It was Lynn H Nyhart, who's a historian of 19th and 20th century European biology. And almost done here. I'm sorry this is taking so long. Ah, yes, another AHA president. This takes us up to 2012, when Bill Cronin was elected uh, president of the American Historical uh, Association, um, built on the uh, history of Frederick Jackson Turner and Merle Curdy serving in that position and the uh, of his research and accomplishments. 
uh, in just a few years ago, five years ago, uh, under the stewardship of then chair uh, James Sweet, the Department of History created a board of visitors. Some of the members I hope are still with us in this uh, in this presentation. Here was another one of my favorite images. I'd be happy to know if anybody has thoughts about that. I thought it encapsulated well this idea of lending critical support to maintain and enhance our department's uh, stature in re research, teaching, and pro professional service. The idea being that the Board of Visitors is a crucial tool in helping us adapt to any obstacles we uh, encounter. So um, last, second to the last slide, uh, commemorates the merger of the history department with the history of science department in 19, sorry, in 2017. Um, we now have two degree programs within the Department of History. One is the degree program in history and the other is in the history of science medicine and technology. I think uh, most of the faculty members involved would agree that it's been uh, a, a, a positive move that it was, um, that it was uh, on balance of good, uh, has been a good collaboration and was a good thing for both departments. Um, brief slide uh, at the end here about a report that uh, history faculty were involved in uh, producing for uh, Chancellor Rebecca Blank. This was on the history of the KKK at the UW. The committee that um, put together this report was chaired by Steve Kantrowitz in the history department. And a member of the committee was Chris, Christy Clark Puyara, who's a, a fili affiliated member of the history faculty. Um, her main appointment is in uh, Afro-American studies. And there are links here. You can read the report. I've summarized very briefly the recommendations that the report put forward to the chancellor. If this is indeed the last slide. Uh, simply gives acknowledgment to Northwestern University for the software on which this is built, to the historical, historical society for permitting us to link to its uh, collections, uh, its images in collections without paying fees for that. Uh, and uh, that's about it. I've turned this thing over to the history department, which as I said earlier, will launch it somewhere on the web so you'll be able to go through and page through it yourself. I would hope that slides would be added to it over time. And I want to make a pitch uh, just briefly here for the software itself. Um, this, as I said, is something that comes out of uh, uh, Northwestern University. You'll see on this slide here a link to the software. It's called Timeline JS. And I think I want to show you just briefly. This is the guts of it. It's simply a spreadsheet, nothing more. A spreadsheet with the year, the headline, the text, links to images, etc. It couldn't be simpler. You simply create this in Google Drive on the web, uh, go through a little process to put it up uh, via the Night Lab page, and uh, there you are. You have uh, the timeline. So I'm going to stop. Uh, should I stop sharing this? I'll probably stop sharing this figure out how to do that. Stop sharing. There it is. And uh, leave it at that. I don't think we need the timeline if there are still uh, any questions, if there are still any attendees left. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Sure. Are there any questions or comments? Just remember to use the hand raising function in the center bottom of your screen. Gary. Gary, have you turned on your microphone? OK, Gary, I'm going to skip to Tristan, and we'll come back to you. Tristan? Yeah. Like I can click a link on here. Here, no. I'm still okay. Tristan, what is your question? Um, 
Be sure to turn on your microphone. It's near where you raised your hand. Okay. Are there any other questions? David. Huh. There's a doesn't seem to be a microphone button to click. Yeah. Oh, okay. I can fix this. Okay, Jean, you should be able to turn your microphone now and I will look at the chat for questions after you ask yours. No? Okay, I'll go to the chat box. Yeah, huh. All I see is chat that are not questions. Okay, here we go. So if you haven't ever used the chat box in Blackboard Collaborate, go over to where you see the three white lines in the purple kind of disc. And when you see the speech bubble, you'll see a place then to type in your question. Yeah. I'm sorry about these technical difficulties. I'm trying to adjust the settings to make sure that everyone can use their microphone and I'm not seeing any difference. Okay, Tristan asks, hello, thank you for the lecture. Can you describe how the teaching of history, specifically US military history, changed during and after the Vietnam War at the University of Wisconsin? Um, <clears throat> well, I, um, I can't. Um, what, I, uh, what I have done in this uh, timeline is simply try to have it. I said at the outset um, that I have not become a historian of the department and as a result I can't answer these kinds of questions. Most of what I know about the department is in fact uh, encapsulated in the timeline. So um, what I would what I can do though I think is give you some uh, advice or some yeah some advice about where to turn to find out more about that. Um, the principal thing I think I would look at is some of the interviews available on the UW Archives website, I believe it is, uh, with historians. So the, the UW Archives has a policy, uh, it's been in place I think for quite some time, of interviewing um, faculty members when they retire or when they leave the university. And so it seems to me you probably could go there uh, and look at to see, for example, if there's an interview with Mac Kaufman, um, who was a, a longtime U.S. military historian with the department, and see whether um, I would think that would be one thing he would talk about would be changes uh, in the um, environment for military history. Um, the other alternative would be to talk to military historians about that. Uh, who might, I was going to say talk to Matt Kaufman, but I'm not sure if that's still possible. Um, but otherwise, it would be a, essentially a matter of oral history interviews, I think. You'd have to 
rely on. Great. We have a couple of comments reflecting on how heavy the offerings in ancient history were early on in the curriculum. Do you have anything yeah. to add about that? Uh, not really, except, you know, they're there all along. Uh, they're there. You can say that uh, the history department was was founded on ancient history in some ways, um, because even before the department as such existed, it was there in the curriculum, as you saw, uh, even in the 1850s. Later on, the course catalogs uh, came to be organized in terms of American history, not US, but American, and that eventually expanded, as I said, to include Canada and Latin America and Mexico. And then modern history, and that was mainly European imperial aspects. And then the third category throughout was ancient and medieval. So long and distinguished history there in our uh, in our department. And even uh, William Francis Allen himself was uh, hired as a historian of ancient and history, which fits with very much with that um, aspect of the early curriculum. I have a question, Colleen. Have you come across mm -hmm. in all of your research any sense that the history department specifically had a unique relationship to the Wisconsin idea um, as compared with other units on campus or the university overall, a sense of mission, um, especially with regard to the extension and um, local historical societies? Mm -hmm. uh, not more than, I mean, there's a couple of, uh, the slide I have on the Wisconsin idea, there are links to a couple of histories, including that article by Frederick Jackson Turner, um, and then uh, publications on the uh, Wisconsin idea specifically, his article was about the extension movement. Uh, but uh, the, certainly the, my impression is that, that historians or the cluster of social science sort of faculty in this school of history, uh, economics and political science that Richard Ely directed were very deeply involved in the extension movement in particular, and that, that for them that was the Wisconsin idea. That plus, you know, the kind of work that John R. Commons and his colleagues in legislation, working with legislators to draft legislation. That's another form of uh, that kind of outreach on the part of the university. Thank you. David, are you able to turn on your microphone? I tried to change the settings, and it may be possible now. Can you hear me? Yes. Can I be here? OK. Yes, thank you very much for the lecture. I thought it was really interesting. I was a little bit late, so I didn't catch the first part. But my question is this. What did you find in, or what have you found generally in your experience or in your study of this topic of the history of the department in terms of its impact on the teaching of history in public schools through, I don't know, publications of textbooks or committees that were formed at the state legislative level where history professors from the UW got involved in setting up the curriculum. Uh, I'm always wondering what, what the, the impact of the department is on how this is being taught at the public school level and, and if there is much impact. Mm. Well, no, I didn't run across that and that it, it could well be um, because I, you know, I only skimmed the surface of the available sources, mainly using the course catalogs uh, to try and track um, <clears throat> growth in the size of faculty and, and uh, shifts in uh, courses that were being offered. Uh, that kind of thing, there's a couple of, couple of ways to go with that. It, it, read on the history of that. The, a couple of things I would recommend. One would be uh, a book by Ian Tyrell that I cite on one of the slides called Historian in Public. Uh, I think that if I'm remembering right, the academic historian's relations with K-12 teachers is one of the topics that he covers. Um, there is also a book that came out more recently the author's last name is Townsend. Townsend, I think it is. Uh, History's Babel. 
Um, and that, uh, I cite that on the slide about the historical society. It has a chapter about uh, uh, discussion of historical societies. And if I'm remembering right, it also talks about relations with, um, with uh, public school teachers, especially through the AHA. That, I think that would be the kind of nexus of, of institutional um, exchange uh, in the country about Wisconsin specific I couldn't tell you. I'm not even okay. sure where you would go to, where you would look for that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I see a couple of comments and I wanna um, answer or ask um, Jennifer's question on her behalf. Um, so can, one- I can actually see. Oh, you can see I can them. see okay. it. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, the development of area studies. Uh, Good question. That's uh, principally a post-war uh, development. Um, I can't say I came across it in the sources I looked at. That's not to say that you couldn't come across it. You couldn't find out some more about it. Um, no, not even, you know, that, that four-volume history of the university is a wonderful resource, but of course it can't get into the kind of granular history of individual departments. And so um, even that's not terribly helpful for this kind of question. It will talk about the development of area studies, but not specifically how it might have affected the history department. Certainly the case today that, as, as you well know, Jennifer, that um, the majority of, of faculty in the history department have some connections with area studies programs, Latin American studies, uh, LASIS, um, uh, everything, Middle Eastern studies, European studies, African studies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how that affected the department, I don't know. In other words, I guess one way to think about it would be the department develop its expertise in these other geographic areas as a result of the growth of area studies? Uh, or did the hiring of the history department's hiring of faculty members like Philip Curtin and Jan Van Sina contribute to the development of African studies on campus? I think in that particular instance, the, the causal arrow ran from the history department to African studies, but I wouldn't swear to that. Sorry. Claire. Hi, thanks. Um, thanks, Colleen, for uh, showing the importance of ancient history um, you bet. In, in the story of the history department. That's very important to bring out. I um, actually just wanted to share a little anecdote with you all um, about the one of the ancient history professors who came to UW in 1920, a man called Michael Rostovsev. And Rostovsev went on, he was already when he came here in his 50s, he was an emigre from the Russian Revolution. Um, and he came to Oxford first, and there was a various amount of maneuverings by Western uh, and a various other members of the faculty to get him to come to Wisconsin. Um, and then he left in 1925 to go to Yale and have a kind of uh, stellar career at Yale. But when he was here, um, I just want to read you a bit of a letter in the archives here between Paxton, who was on your uh, right. slides earlier, and, and Westerman. They're talking about Rasovsev, who, as I said, was Russian, um, and they're discussing him in the classroom. Um, it's uh, quite amusing. I'll just uh, re read a little bit for you all. Um, uh, uh, Paxton says to Westerman, is there any reason we should not ask Rasovsev to stay. The only obstacle that he has presented itself that, that has presented itself at all is his English. And here I think that the difficulty is considerable, but need not be regarded as prohibitive. He speaks English with great fluency, right? He does, I see in the letters. Um, and uh, we all understand him easily. There are, however, a good many students, either indolent or unintelligent, who cannot or think they cannot understand him. If he should remain, I suspect that the freshman class would shrink in size considerably, but that his hold upon the university and and his better students would steadily increase more than enough to offset any disadvantage attached to a shrinking freshman class. 
I think that all of us who have heard him lecture to the freshmen will be willing to risk his English for the sake of having him in the departments, uh, etc., etc., which I find uh, very amusing. Plus a change. That's all. Yeah. That's some things, something. <laughs> Scott. Thanks, Colleen, for a, a great presentation and all your work on this. It's amazing. Um, when you were walking us through the chart on enrollment changes across uh, the World War II period, I'm sort of thinking about the current context and all of mm -hmm. the unknowns right now. I mean, we have no idea if we're going to be uh, in person or online in the fall. We don't right. know how many students are actually going to come in the next class. Um, we don't know how we're going to do SOAR. Uh, did your kind of, you know, study of the institution, how it's met, the, you know, challenges over these years, all the different changes, has, does that give you any sort of special insight on how we might adapt to this, these current upheavals? Tough question, I guess, but. <laughs> yeah. No, no. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, one of the one of the differences, of course, with the World War II experiences, there was war going on in Europe for two years before we got into it, and hostilities before that. And I would think that maybe the UW was better prepared for it than we were for this. I mean, you go back three months, and this this coronavirus catastrophe was not even on anybody's radar, right? Where at least they would have had some months, if not a year or two, to begin to prepare for it. I think it would be interesting just in the same way that you see references now to the World War II efforts to mobilize the economy for war through the War Production Board um, and other national agencies. I think it would be interesting to go back and say, I would start with the four volume history of the of the UW and read the chapters on World War II and see if, if there's any insight to be gleaned. Try to, if not plan for, at least adjust to the changes. Might be helpful. Great, thanks Colleen, we miss you. Good to see you. Is that the end of the questions? Well, unless there are any other questions, we're at an hour and a half. And um, I would like to thank you very sincerely on behalf of the department for presenting all of this work with us. It's been really great to learn from you today. It's been my pleasure. I had a lot of and I, and I do want to make a pitch to those of you to consider using this um, software uh, the timeline JS in your classes. You can have somebody from Do It come in, well, come in, uh, do a virtual instruction in in very little time. It would it takes hardly anything to to train people on how to use it, and then they can make their own timelines like this. It's cool. That's excellent. Go out and find the primary sources, find the illustrations, write the footnotes, all that stuff. It could be a great active learning tool. Right, exactly. Have all a right. wonderful well, thank night. Thank you all for, for coming, and uh, I, I, I hope you, when it gets uh, finds a home on the web, I hope you'll uh, take some time to to through the timeline. Oh, there's so much right. more beneath the surface within all those hyperlinks. That's what I'm looking forward right. to. All right, take yeah. care. All right, bye bye. Goodbye.